Good evening. My name is Arnold Franklin. I'm the director of the Queens College Center for Jewish Studies. Before we formally begin this evening's program, I would like to recognize Assembly Member Daniel Rosenthal, um, who has been a strong advocate for us in Albany on issues relevant to the kinds of things we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, and has been a strong supporter of Queens College and CUNY. Um, Assemblyman Rosenthal, would you like to offer a few words? Thank you, everyone. This is uh, the second time in about two weeks. I've been, uh, oh, I guess we had Passover, so about three weeks that I've been at Queens College, and that's because of the dedication of uh, President Frank Wu, who has done a terrific job at putting on these important programs, especially um, the Center for Jewish Studies, Jewish Life. These acronyms confuse me. But um, you know, yesterday, two days ago, the ADL released their report on the record-breaking anti-Semitism in New York. And what was more horrifying about that report was that I don't think any of us in this room were surprised to see that. We've all seen the headlines and we've all seen what has been going on. And it feels that every single year we read the same headline, a record amount of anti-Semitic attacks. And what's more importantly is that if someone is an anti-Semite, deep down they're a racist, they're a bigot. And we see that in the rise in anti-Asian attacks as well. And we must be vigilant, we must educate, we must do more to make sure that that does not become the new normal and we do not have that be the headlines again next year. And I know you have the expert in that here tonight and I look forward to hearing from him as well. Thank you for being with us tonight. Uh, it's an honor to welcome you to this year's Yom HaShoah lecture. If this is your first time attending one of our programs, I encourage you to visit us on the Queens College website where you will find announcements of future events and recordings of past lectures. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Zabrowski family in memory of Marvin and Selena Zabrowski. Beloved to many here tonight, Marvin and Selena were born in Poland, Marvin in the town of Zarki and Selena in Krakow. Both survived the war years in hiding, emigrating in the early 1950s to the US, where they met, married, and ultimately settled in Queens to raise a family. Marvin fulfilled the American dream, becoming a successful businessman. In their new home, the couple also devoted their lives to Holocaust remembrance and education. Marvin was among the founders and longtime board members of the American Society for Yad Vashem. And through their generosity, Marvin and Selena supported a broad range of initiatives aimed at sustaining awareness of the Holocaust on American college campuses. Among their many contributions was the endowment of an annual Yom HaShoah lecture here at Queens College. Selena died in January 2021, and Marvin nine months later in October 2021. And so it is with a mixture of sadness and deep gratitude that we remember them here tonight at our first in-person Yom HaShoah lecture since their passing. It's especially meaningful that we have Marvin and Selena's sons, Mark and Ziggy, uh, their daughters-in-law, Judy and Galit, uh, and grandchildren, Matthew and Anna, in the audience tonight. And Jeremy. Fifteen years ago, almost to the day, the Queens College Center for Jewish Studies hosted a two-day conference with the somewhat provocative title, Is It 1938 Again? The reference, of course, was to the widespread attacks on Jews and Jewish property that took place during the night of November 9, 1938, what we know as Kristallnacht and the opening chapter in the horrors of the Holocaust. In hindsight, two things about that 2007 conference stand out. The first is its explicit focus on a geographical context beyond the borders of the US. The conference program identified radical Islamism embodied in the figure of Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and his expressed wish to destroy the state of Israel as the new chief threat facing the Jews. The other noteworthy thing is the participants' response to the question that framed the conference, as the overwhelming majority of speakers resoundingly rejected drawing comparisons to 1930s Germany. Thinking back over the events of the last seven years, the cold-blooded killing of nine African Americans at a Bible study in Charleston in 2015 by a white supremacist, the deadly neo-Nazi demonstration in Charlottesville in 2017, the murderous assault on the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh in 2018, the shooting at a San Diego synagogue in 2019 inspired by a medieval blood libel accusation, the many attacks on mosques from New Zealand to Norway fueled by white supremacist ideology, 
and the skyrocketing number of reported hate crimes against the Asian American and Pacific Islander community in the US in 2020. As we review this recent history, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the world today feels different than it did in, 20, in 2007. The problem, it seems, is now here in our own backyard, and it's real. Sadly, Queens College, too, has felt the rising tide of hatred. As many in the audience know, on January 6th, the first anniversary of the failed insurrection at the US Capitol, racist and anti-Semitic messages were found in a campus building that is home to the Africana Studies Department, Queens College's Higher Education Access Program, and the Center for Ethnic, Racial, and Religious Understanding. Which brings us to tonight's program, which the Center for Jewish Studies envisioned as both a way to mark Yom HaShoah and the horrifying results of unbridled hatred, and a step on the path towards healing within our own campus community. And so we are delighted to have with us Jonathan Greenblatt, CEO of the Anti-Defamation League, to discuss his new book, It Could Happen Here, a book that takes very seriously the possibility that the US is now on the edge of a precipice. Jonathan joined ADL in 2015 after serving in the White House as Special Assistant to President Barack Obama and as Director of the Office of Social Innovation and Civic Participation. He entered government service following a distinguished career in business as a successful social entrepreneur and corporate executive. Joining Jonathan is Queens College President Frank Wu. Frank was named President of Queens College in 2020. Prior to that, he served as Chancellor and Dean and then William L. Prosser Distinguished Professor at University of California Hastings College of the Law in San Francisco. Before joining UC Hastings, he was a member of the faculty at Howard University and Dean of Wayne State University Law School in Detroit. Jonathan will begin by offering a few remarks and then we'll join Frank for a conversation. And then, a few minutes after that, we'll take questions from our audience, both in person and online. And anyone wishing to submit a question can do so using uh, the email address that you see on the banner behind me um, at any point during the program. Um, it could happen qc at gmail.com. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to turn things over to Jonathan Greenblatt. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you, Dr. Franklin. I appreciate it. I'm just going to speak briefly in the interest of getting to the conversation with Frank. But I do want to acknowledge the Zorowski family for your generosity and support of this lecture in honor of your parents. And it's interesting to be here on the anniversary, or excuse me, era of Yom HaShoah, right, which is a day that I think all of us remember and mourn. So it's a day of quite a lot of potential. And for those who don't know, today is also the third anniversary of the shooting in Poway by the white supremacist who Dr. Franklin mentioned as well. So it's a, a day of some weight. And I feel the weight on my shoulders as I stand here to speak to you this evening. This is an extraordinarily diverse institution in arguably the most diverse city in the world, a city that has welcomed Jews and so many other minorities throughout its history. And yet we also need to acknowledge that something has changed. And we see this at ADL, we're the oldest anti-hate organization in the country, founded in 1913 in the wake of a Jewish man being lynched outside of Atlanta. Falsely accused of a crime, wrongfully convicted, and then torn from his cell by a lynch mob and hung from a tree. And while his body still swung from the rope, the town gathered around and held a picnic under the corpse and took photographs that they turned into postcards and they gave them out as souvenirs to remember that day. But in the wake of that, the ADL was founded with this extraordinary mission statement that was written 109 years ago that our purpose is to, quote, stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment to all. That dual message of making the Jewish people safe by making everyone safe and realizing that everyone will be safe only when the Jewish people are safe is the sort of encoded in the, in the organizational DNA of ADL, which makes us very unique. Now that uniqueness comes into play because while we've stood up in recent years against anti-black racism, against anti-AAPI hate, 
against you know, rising xenophobia against immigrants. The issues facing the Jewish people today are profound and they're terrifying. So Dr. Franklin just referenced the report that we released yesterday. We have been doing an audit of anti-Semitic incidents in America for more than 40 years. We've been tracking this data longer than the FBI. Before there was hate crimes laws, there was ADL on the ground in communities collecting information about acts of harassment and vandalism and violence. And 2021 was the highest total we've ever seen in more than 40 years. The number of assaults leapt 167% year over year. 88 attacks across the country, encompassing over 130 people. In K-12 schools, an increase of 106%. 106%. Up 22% of colleges and universities like Queens College. And this data is information that my 25 offices collect in the field. And we verify everything we report. And we are meticulous. And we are rigorous. And we are alarmed. And here in New York, here in New York City, the place where I feel so blessed to be all of us in so many ways, we saw a 24% increase year over year. New York State is the state that has the distinction of having the most anti-Semitic incidents in the country, followed by New Jersey and California. Now, I got news for you. And I don't know how you vote today, and I really don't care. But I will tell you that anti-Semitism is coming from all sides. And I'll identify three threats, and then I'll talk about why I think it's happening, and then we'll have the conversation. So first, there is no question that the extreme right remains a real problem. Dr. Franklin referenced a number of attacks against Jews and other minorities. There's a straight line from Charlottesville to Capitol Hill with a data point like Poway today in between. The extreme right has been responsible for the vast majority, like 75 to 80 percent of the extremist related murders have taken place over the last decade. If you go back farther to the Oklahoma City bombing, it's not even close, domestic extremism. They remain a clear and present danger. But secondly, the threat that I'm also equally, if not more, concerned about in this moment is what I'll call the radical left. The appropriation of the most hideous anti sort of slander against the Jewish people being lobbied against the Jewish state. And look, I was the first to stand up when President Trump made the, or candidate Trump, made the horrendous claims he did about Mexicans and Muslims the day that he announced his candidacy in July of 2015. And I said then, words matter. And you know what? Words matter today. When the congresswoman from the Bronx, who represents some people here in Queens, makes claims that Israel is holding Palestinian kids in cages, they are not. And when other members of Congress claim that Israel is committing a genocide, it is not. And when you make wild claims, don't be surprised when you see wild things happen, like here, in New York City in May of 2021, when around the fighting in Gaza, there was a wave of anti-Semitic incidents across the country with Jews beaten and brutalized in broad daylight in Times Square, in the Diamond District, in Brooklyn, where, by the way, there's situations happening every day. So words matter. It starts with words, whether you're from the left or the right. Thirdly and finally, I'll just note the, I continue to be troubled, and we all should be, by the rise of Islamic extremism. You mentioned Ahmadinejad, Dr. Franklin, in your opening remarks. If it bothers you what Vladimir Putin says about Ukraine, and it should, if it bothers you to see him express annihilationist rhetoric against Ukraine, to delegitimize it as a country, to demonize its people, to question its veracity, it should equally alarm you when the mullahs in Tehran say the very same thing. Again, it starts with words and they matter. They matter. So in a country that seems so polarized today, 
with unfortunately the memory of the Holocaust continuing to fade, where people are caught in their tribes and social media, social media is both symptomatic of this polarization and fueling it. I think we're living in troubled times. So that's what the book is about. And to close, as we move it over, Frank, to this portion of the conversation, I'll simply say, I'm here tonight as the grandson of a Holocaust survivor from Germany. My grandfather was from Magdeburg, Germany. And when he was a young man, the age of some of you in the audience, he never would have guessed that one day, the only country he ever knew, that one day it would turn on him regard him as an enemy of the state, destroy everything that he ever loved, slaughter his almost his entire family and his network of friends, and force him to come here as a refugee. My grandfather never would have guessed when he was your age that one day his grandchildren, me and my brother and my cousins, would be born in America. And I stand here tonight as the husband of a political refugee from Iran. I'm guessing you have some Persian Jews in the student body, and my wife and her family, Iran's the only country they ever knew, and they never would have guessed before the Islamic Revolution, before the rise of the kind of fascism of Khomeini, that one day they would have to flee. The only country they ever knew, because the government would destroy everything they ever loved and force them to come here as refugees, which they did in 1989. And my father-in-law never would have guessed when he was a young person that his grandchildren, my kids, my nieces and nephews would be born here in America. So let me tell you something, especially to the Zorovsky family, especially to the grandchildren. Don't think for a minute that you can assume that your grandchildren will be born in this country unless we fight for what we have unless we take these threats seriously, unless we listen to the tyrants who would try to terrorize us and we do something about it. All right, now we'll... Thank you so much for those powerful words and thank you all for joining us on our beautiful campus here at Queens College. This is a conversation, and you're welcome to send your questions, again, to this email address. And those of you who are here, we are so grateful that you joined us in person. We're also streaming this live. So if uh, you have family or friends who weren't able to come, they can still tune in. This is being recorded, and uh, they can watch afterward. Uh, let me jump right in. Uh, with a, a question we had chatted about, about coalitions. So as someone who's Asian American, I appreciate greatly the example of ADL and the many Jewish groups that have led the way in civil rights. If you look back to the late 50s and early 60s, it was in large part because of an alliance between African Americans and all of the Jewish groups that the historic struggle for black equality was successful, passage of the 1964 Civil Rights right. Act and so on. That faded away and maybe gave way to friction. In the 1990s, Cornell West and Michael Lerner actually convened a conference, wrote a book, they did a lot of things yeah. 25 years ago to talk about how yeah. can we bring people together again. Would you share your thoughts about coalitions, the importance of bridge building, and how can we do that now in the 2020s? So, look, America is, I will say right up front, like I believe in American exceptionalism. I know this is out of step or out of fashion in a lot of places, but I think this is the greatest democracy in the history of humanity. For all of its flaws, for all of its problems, like literally written into the founding document of this nation is the desire to create a more perfect union the desire to do better and to give everyone a chance. And maybe the country didn't realize its promise in 1787 or 1776, and we're still a work in progress. But the country's always been founded on this very pluralistic notion. And so for the Jewish people, this has been a boon. 
and the country has allowed us so much opportunity, as with other immigrant groups. But the reality is if we want to, again, achieve our true equality and a sense of belonging and purpose, we have got to work in coalition with others. I deeply believe this. Look, if you're a Jewish in this audience, congratulations. You represent, I don't know, less than 2% of the entire US population. Less than 2%. We're tiny. Anybody who thinks we can go it ourselves, I don't know if you're, you might need to take an arithmetic class here at the <laughs> Queens College. We need to work with others, not because it's a quid pro quo, but because there's strength in numbers. Now that's not easy. That is hard. That can be challenging. And I think about specifically, you know, in terms of the historic relationship between the black and Jewish community, there is so much we have in common. From histories of enslavement, to a shared struggle for equality, to a deep commitment to our faith traditions. And look, there are you know, Jews of color, African American Jews. And there are many Jewish families with, in biracial relationships. We're a multiracial community and a multi-heritage community. Now that being said, it's true that while there was great, uh, if you will, camaraderie, I think in the 50s and 60s, as the civil rights movement took inspiration from the Hebrew liberation, and uh, the Jewish people felt a degree of kinship as well, it's certainly true that the relationship has frayed over time. There have been pressure points, you know, just down the road in Crown Heights in the 90s, pressure points. Disagreement about things like busing and affirmative action, pressure points. And yet there's also been so much commonality. And on a day-to-day -day basis, if you go to a black church, the level of love for like uh, the Jewish tradition, the level of identity with Zionism, the state of Israel, the sense of kinship is palpable. Um, I look, I, I feel so blessed to be in relationship with Mark Morial and the National Urban League. ADL has a deep partnership with the Urban League. I feel blessed to be in relationship with Derek Johnson, the CEO of the NAACP. We have a deep relationship with the NAACP Legal Defense with many of the organized groups. There are challenges at the activist level. There are challenges with some of the folks involved in the Black Lives Matter movement. Though you may know the Movement for Black Lives, this coordinating body has said some ugly, hostile anti-Semitic things, making you know, farcical and slanderous claims about the state of Israel committing genocide and whatnot. And there are certainly people in the Jewish community who've said hostile, racist things about black people. So all of us need to acknowledge, and I'll say this here, I don't believe in cancel culture. I don't believe in it. I think it's a bad idea. I think it's antithetical to our Jewish tradition. I believe in what my friend Nick Cannon calls council culture. Council culture. Look, all of us should acknowledge we all sin, right? We all err. We all can seek to do better. And so I think what's important is to acknowledge when we err, listen authentically to the other side, and then seek to repair the breach. I think we make mistakes, others make mistakes. We need to work to mend fences because we ultimately have so much more in common than the things that set us apart. Th thank you. That's a, a great answer which we should take to heart. I know there's much work for us to do, even here in the world's borough on a campus such as this, with more than 4,000 Jewish students. We typically rank in the top 10 in the U.S. Uh, college campuses, uh, an incredibly diverse population, probably the largest Bukharian Jewish population That's of any amazing. college campus. Pretty awesome. Uh, let me make the questions a little more provocative as we go along. Well, here we so, go. All right, so let's, let's start on the left. You mm -hmm. referenced uh, the left. Mm -hmm. Again, there are so many parallels. Asian Americans face a claim that sometimes is made about Jews as well. Yeah. You're white adjacent. You're honorary whites. Yeah. You're more or less white. You're privileged. You don't have any issues. You don't have any problems. You're a model minority. And so sometimes you read about, not, not here, but elsewhere, you read about DEI training where Jews are made to feel that they've never suffered. Talk to us about that. How, how should we think this through? And, and give me advice as a college president. How, how should I deal with this? So it's a great question, Frank, and a hard question. So first and foremost, I think, let's just lay out the context. There is an issue in this country with systemic racism. 
there is. There are persistent socioeconomic inequities that specifically affect certain population segments more so than others. I mean, if you don't believe me, you should look at the data. I think any honest broker will tell you this. Everything from third grade literacy to sentencing guidelines to incarceration rates and so on and so forth. I mean, it's real, it's there, you can see it. And so I think the desire to make America uh, more inclusive of all people, to acknowledge that we can do better is great. But you know, the, the notion of DEI is in and of itself very noble, but there is something deeply, profoundly wrong when DEI doesn't include all, when it's not really equality in as much as it include all communities. And a lot of these, we've looked at these DEI programs at universities, at corporations, and indeed, oftentimes it just breaks people down into this binary, oppressor, oppressed. White, everyone else. And then you have like white adjacent. <laughs> like Asian Americans are white adjacent. So you're not really oppressed. Tell that to the elderly Asian American people getting attacked in broad daylight down the road in Queens. Tell that to the owners of the Chinese restaurants who were bo or the Asian markets who were boycotted in 2020. Like, give me a break. I have no tolerance. I have no patience for that. And Jews face it too. Oh, you've, you're fine. I, someone once said, I, I read, they said to me, that the Holocaust was, quote, white on white crime. I think that is profane and grotesque. So, what do we do? I think we need DEI as an ideal, but in practically, practicality, I think we need diversity, opportunity, and inclusion. Just see, create spaces where everyone can be heard and everyone can achieve their full potential. I deeply believe in this. So one of the things we're doing at ADL is developing modules and content to slot into those DEI programs to say, does it include the Jewish experience? Does it include the Asian American experience? Does it really cover the gamut? But we need to break this binary thing that you're either racist or anti-racist. I'm sorry, I don't buy it. I just don't. But I will tell you, I am deeply committed to fighting racism in all forms. But I don't need other people to label me and tell me what I am or you as an Asian American. Now, at the end of the day, I mentioned before to your prior question about coalitions. We work intensely and intentionally in coalitions. And I'm particularly proud of what we've done with the Asian American community. So we started getting calls in early 2020 about hate crimes against, do you know this story, Frank? I don't think Please. I this. Please. About, Asian, about hate crimes against Asian Americans. When the president was saying all these crazy things about the Wuhan flu and the Chinese virus. And police started calling us around the country and saying, hey, we're concerned about this. They didn't know who necessarily to call in the Asian American community. They call us because we train all the police in extremism and hate. ADL is the largest educator in America of law enforcement on issues of extremism and hate. Last year, we trained more than 19,000 officers. And so they would reach out to us, and we responded. And I got a call in the spring of that year from a prominent Asian American person who said, hey, we're concerned. Could we sit down and talk? So I did a Zoom with a bunch of prominent Asian American academics and business people. I'm sorry, you weren't on a Frank. One was excluded, obviously, omitted. And uh, long and short of it is that we then incubated a new organization, the Asian American Foundation at ADL, with some of the most prominent people from the community on board, like the CEO of KKR, the co-founder of Yahoo, the owner of the Brooklyn Nets, extraordinary people. And we hired the staff. We train the people, and I could not be more proud that the you know, American Jewish ADL is working hand in hand with the Asian American community to fight hate. That to me is one of the things I'm most proud of that I've done in this organization in the last seven years. And, and th thank you so much. Feel free to call me. I'd be happy to talk with you. Uh, be careful what you wish for. So. Let's turn to the right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and by the way, left, right, like all these labels are crazy. Crazy people on the fringe should be put back on the fringe. That's what I think. You know, like, I don't think, you know, I don't think that Marjorie Taylor Greene is the reasonable right. I don't think Madison Cawthorn is the reasonable right. I don't think Ilhan Omar is the reasonable left. And when I say that, what I mean is the people who are divisive, 
who, in, who knowingly say things that aren't true, who spread conspiracies, I'm sorry, I don't think they represent the kind of democratic small d standards we've had in this country. So I think one of our obligations is to take the lunatic fringe and keep them on the fringe as much as possible. Well, I was going to ask you a question about former President Trump. Please. <laughs> but, but the timing might be interpreted <laughs> differently by different people. So there's a, another new phenomenon I'm a little troubled by, and yeah. President Trump is the only one to have displayed this. Some have called it philo-Semitism, uh -huh. a love of Jews. So you uh -huh. see it sometimes evangelical Christians who support the state of Israel for their own faith system, they believe it's necessary. Uh, President Trump talked about Jews as making money and described it in a positive way, what he perceived of as a positive way. There are Asians who repeat some of the stereotypes that often are quite negative, but they give it a positive valence. And how should we respond to this type of supposedly positive stereotyping, oh, Jews are good at making money, let's applaud them. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, I'm troubled by this. Yeah, I mean, I think it is troubling. Um, I think, look, stereotypes are shorthand, you know, generalizations for a group of people, right, based on some perceived attribute. And oftentimes stereotypes are negative, like Jews are cheap or whatever. Uh, I don't want to repeat them. And sometimes those stereotypes can be quote unquote positive. I think all, I think all such generalizations are dangerous. I really do. Because they end up lumping people into categories. Now, without reference to their particular qualities, I think we judge people on the content of their character, right? That's how we should evaluate every person as individuals on their merits. Um, that being said, I appreciate that some might think it's out of a love of Judaism that I think President Trump said that he wanted accountants who were all short wearing yarmulkes or something. <laughs> he want, that's what he wanted, counting his money. That's what he says. That's what he wanted, counting his money. Uh, okay, thanks. Um, but I think the reality is when we are instrumentalized or fetishized, it's not really very helpful. Now, at the same time, we'll also acknowledge that uh, we have to, it's, a, it's incumbent upon us to explain why things can be problematic. Israel needs all the friends it's, it can have. It's been boycotted. It's been demonized for decades since its inception. So I appreciate that there may be some, with some of whose values I might like or not like, who have a love for the state of Israel. I give them that, and I will, I can find common ground in some areas, even if I disagree with them in other areas. Uh, let's turn to the diversity within the Jewish population. Pew Research released a survey about a year ago, no yeah. doubt you read it's a 200 page study, yeah. just about every fact and figure you can imagine. One of their findings, it fascinated me. Uh, I'm paraphrasing, so this is only approximate, but they, they said something like 80% of the Jewish population in the United States that is not Orthodox identifies as liberal or democratic. And then within the Orthodox population, which is about 10% of the overall Jewish population, it's flipped around, a mirror yeah. image. 80%, 75 to 80% voted for and approved of President Trump. Well, what do you make of this diversity within the Jewish population? Well, I think, you know, it's quite interesting. I mean, I think the American Jewish community is indeed more diverse than people give us credit, right? Again, it may be that the vast majority of American Jews are descended, as are Ashkenazi Jews, descended from people who came from Europe. But the reality is, as you have reflected on this campus, we have Sephardi Jews, we have Mizrahi Jews, we have Jews of color, we have Jews at different levels of observance, we have Jews who identify as cultural, we have Jews who identify as ethnic, we have all kinds of Jews. So that being said, it shouldn't surprise us that there is some degree of diversity in the Jewish political experience. I think for a long time, Jews more identified with the Democratic Party, and I still think if you look at the polling, not just the Pew polling, but the voting patterns, like for example in 2000, it's 2020. The thing that's out there, I think more Jews voted for, I think more Latino people voted for Trump than Jews. Literally, more Latino people voted for President Trump than Jews. I think 70 some odd percent of Jews voted for Biden. So overwhelmingly, Jews had as, and as patriotic, I'm sorry, as democratic. I think in part that's because they felt a kinship with the Democratic Party because of FDR, 
letting Jews in, though not nearly enough, during the Second World War, because of President Truman's support for the State of Israel when it was founded, because of President Kennedy's open relationship. I mean, there are a bunch of different reasons. That being said, you know, if you look at the level of religious observance, I think Orthodox Jews, not politically, but if we could say from a value system, have much more in common with what we might characterize as kind of evangelical voters or Christian conservatives. They don't believe in abortion. They don't believe in gay marriage. They have a very small o orthodox interpretation, more literal interpretation of many of the things in the Old Testament and those values that guide them. And I think the Republican Party speaks more to them than the, than the Democratic Party with its, for example, championing reproductive rights or championing gay marriage. I think those things don't always square with the value sets of people in the orthodox community. So I think it would require some degree of change within the value sets of the parties. Um, but you know, it's interesting for that to alter, but you know, Frank, what's interesting, if you look at the patterns of intermarriage in the Jewish community, I mean, this is a shocking, I mean, it depends on how you, what you care about, I would say. I care about this issue of Jewish continuity. I guess we're a little off topic. But, so intermarriage I find very troubling. Now, there are lots of intermarriages in the Jewish community that result in amazing families. I don't take anything away from that. And, you know, people should marry whoever they want to marry. That being said, I think when the intermarriage rate is north of 50 percent, you know, the, among Reform and conservative Jews, conservative as in denominationally conservative, then that population is just not growing. What is growing is the rate of Orthodox, uh, uh, Orthodox Jews, because the birth rates are higher, the intermarriage is far less. And as they are identifying with more of the Republican Party or conservative values, you're going to see those numbers continue to change. You know, again, Ju reform and conservative Judaism will continue to, to plateau or shrink. So you'll have less Jews voting that way if the value set remains the same. And as the Orthodox community grows, you'll have more people voting in a more conservative manner. I think it seems pre demographically pretty predictable. Uh, another question about diversity within the population, and again, perhaps provocative. So to return to the pre-World War II era, and you spoke briefly uh, on this, there were Jews in Europe, in Germany or Austria, uh, German-speaking parts of Europe, yeah. who had achieved some success, well-to-do, and thought of themselves as assimilated Germans. So. Would you just talk a little bit about assimilation as a strategy compared to pluralism? Here in, in Queens, the world's borough, we see so many communities and much less of the pressure to, to fit in. Is assimilation, this pressure, also perhaps a form of anti-Semitism? Um, I think... So the short answer is no, I don't, think assimil I don't think there is true assimilationist pressure in kind of an exogenous way. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe endogenous to the community that people want to be just like everybody else, and there's a desire to assimilate and a desire to fit in, and I think that's part of the American mosaic. And yet, um, it's not new to America. So my grandfather, my German grandfather, and my Russian paternal grandmother, they weren't exactly rolling in the dough. Um, but my mom's family was better off in Hungary, my, my grandmother and her family. And I'll tell you a fast story. So I went back when I was a junior in college. I studied abroad. And it was 1990. The wall, had, the, German, the wall fell in 89. Germany reunified. And all the countries in Eastern Europe were opening up. And I went to Hungary, where my mom's family was from. And my grandmother and her sisters, they all spoke Magyar. And I grew up around this. So I, I, I don't speak a word of it. Egan. Anyone know, here? Hungarian? Yes. Egan is the word that I know. Yes. Egan, which means, yes. Yes. yes, that's the only word I know. <laughs> so I'm trying to negotiate your way around Budapest. Thank you for correcting me. Good luck. Yeah, I'm hopeless, truly hopeless. Um, but all that being said, I uh, got the address from my mom of, of, a, of a relative, and so I went to see this woman, and she was elderly and lived in a tiny like apartment. And I walked in, and of course I couldn't speak a word of the language. So I found some, some poor fellow on the street who ended up helping me translate. And uh, I walked in, and she had a cross on the wall. And I thought, oh, this must be, maybe something's wrong. And then I tried to explain to her, could I see it was right on Christmas time. She said, she basically said, I'm leaving with my family for Christmas. Come back in a day or two days. I thought, again, that doesn't sound right. But I did that. 
and then she served me for dinner uh, chicken paprikash, right, which is like the Hungarian, standard Hungarian dish. It's chicken like with paprika over dumplings with sour cream, which I'd never seen before. Never seen that before, because it's very trafe. It's not very kosher. And uh, I was so confused. And so when I got home, I said to my grandmother, I said, I don't understand. <laughs> and she explained to me something I had never learned before. So my family was assimilated in Budapest, married to non-Jews. And the Nazis came late in the war. And in the waning days of the war, they took away the Jews and sent them to Auschwitz and Treblinka and incinerated them. And to our family, the ones who were still there, they literally went in and they pulled apart the families. So the Jewish men or Jewish women were taken away and the, the non-Jewish spouses were left behind. So the family that we still had in Hungary, they weren't Jews. They had married in and gone on with their lives, even though all of our relatives were ashes. So I think that assimilationist tendency has always been there. Um, and it poses a great question for the Jewish community of the 21st century in America. How do we maintain our traditions in the face of these challenges? Now, one of the amazing things about Jews is that we are an incredibly adaptive people. We've adapted across continents, across cultures, in all different locales. It'll be interesting to see how we, how we deal with that here. What advice would you have for me as president here at Queens College? On January 6th in Delaney Hall, and Dr. Franklin yeah. spoke yeah. about this, we discovered, we don't know exactly when this happened, probably right around January 6th, which is a significant date. It's also uh, the sentencing in one of those terrible hate crimes that made the headlines. We found a, on a bulletin board, someone had defaced our beautiful campus by scrolling a, a swastika, and the slogan, the KKK lives. Yeah. And it's so important for us to respond to this firmly, resolutely, clearly, not to sweep it under the rug, but to recognize that there's so much work for us to do. And the conjunction of the swastika with the reference to a white supremacist group means that more than one community felt directly threatened, yeah. de deeply traumatized. Yeah. And, and while all of us could feel threatened, uh, I understand for some this is so powerful. How should we respond when there's an incident like that where, to be honest, it's unlikely that we'll ever identify a perpetrator. It was reported to the NYPD and we can't control how they respond to these matters and I can't comment on, on their response, but what's a way to bring a campus together after something like that? It's a really good question and unfortunately many, many campuses are seeing these kinds of incidents. I mentioned a 22% increase in anti-Semitic incidents at colleges and universities in 2021 over the prior year. Uh, there are other acts of racism and hate have proliferated too. I think there are a few things that you can do. Number one, I think you've got to speak out swiftly and strongly when hate happens. You've got to show up and lean in. So it sounds like you did that in this case, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. Sometimes administrations do say, oh, it's not that important. Or there's a hateful anti-Zionist event. Oh, it's just political speech. It doesn't really matter. Those things do matter. We need to call that out quickly and with conviction every time it happens. So number one, you need, leaders need to lead. Right. Number two, I think you need to make sure that the programs that you offer are truly, you know, encompassing. So again, we talked about DEI a few minutes ago. If your DEI programs only teach about anti-black racism and homophobia, those two things matter, don't, mis don't mishear me. But if that's the only thing you touch upon, you're leaving your AAPI students and your Jewish students, maybe your Latino students out in the cold. So I think when we talk about these issues, we need not just to be inclusive, we need to be comprehensive, if you will. That's number two. And then number three, I think it's really important to show up in places where you have people coming together, to show that we lock arms. That is so crucial. We had a situation at uh, American University, it got President Burwell of American University, she's someone, she wrote a beautiful piece 
today's Tuesday, Wednesday, it was on Monday, so it was two days ago. That's worth looking up. Sylvia Burwell is a president of American University. They had a situation where the Muslim group, a Muslim student group pulled out of a interfaith iftar with the local Hillel because of their support of the settler colonialist, whatever garbage they said. And Professor, I'm sorry, President Burwell took a stand against that. I think this mattered so much and sent a strong signal to these students. You can be for, you can be for a two-state solution, you can be for Palestinian rights, you can be for a, a, a Palestinian state that doesn't compel you to denigrate and demonize Jews and to isolate their cultural institutions. And to draw a comparison, look, a lot of people have very strong feelings about the, the government in Beijing and their treatment of the Uyghur minority and how they handle democracy activists in Hong Kong. Very strong feelings. But that is not a pretext to commit acts of violence against Asian American people. That is not an excuse to go protest the Asian American Studies Department at Queens College. I'm sorry. I don't buy it. That is not an excuse to force the Chinese American Students Club to like stop going back to, to China doing trips there. I don't buy it. And by the same token, you can have strong feelings about what's happening in the Middle East. That is not an excuse to beat up Jewish people in Brooklyn. That is not a pretext to, uh, to go demonstrate, let alone deface synagogues or kosher businesses. And it is not an excuse to kind of boycott Jewish institutions. So I think we need, we, leadership needs to lead. Speak up, show up, and make sure that your programs, if you will, truly touch all the students in need. That, that's all great advice, which I, I will follow. And, and I agree uh, with your comments. Uh, I would be the first, if it weren't for the role that I have, to stand up and speak out about the government in Beijing, which is yeah. not one that my family ever supported. Right. Uh, but I always make clear I'm not an agent of the People's Republic of China. I, I'm, I'm an American of born course. here. Right. So, so thank you. There, there's so many parallels. And, so many. And that's why it's so important to, to talk about these that's issues. That's right. And like when elected officials say crazy things about China, why are we surprised when Asian American people get victimized? And so when elected people say crazy things about the Jewish state, why are we surprised when Jewish people get targeted? Like, you don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to figure this out. Right, right. I'm tempted to ask you a question about Chinese food, but uh, yeah. we, we, we actually, uh, on our faculty, there's a, a retired professor who wrote the very first article, by the way, mm. uh, 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, he actually studied this as a sociologist. Why do Jews eat Chinese food? And, and he has a theory about it. It's I'd safe, like to know. It's safe trafe, right? It's it, safe trafe. Right. That, he, he, <laughs> he coined <laughs> that, that <laughs> phrase. All right, but safe trafe. We'll, 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 we'll leave that subject. I'll try uh, that with my dad. All right. Probably, yeah, Let, let's see if there are questions uh, from the audience. Uh, they're going to read them for us from, from the back. Jonathan, there is one question that came in regarding the Holocaust and education. And the question is, how do we continue, or how do you recommend we continue to keep the education going, especially when we have school boards banning books like Mouse? What do we do? What can we say? What stand can we take? Yeah, you know, the Mouse thing's interesting. So I had this, I had this sort of run-in with Whoopi Goldberg earlier this year. And she said, you know, the Holocaust isn't about race. If you open up the book Mouse, you open it up, the first page, there's a quote that says, the Jewish people are definitely a race, just not a human one, said by Adolf Hitler. I guess Whoopi hadn't opened up the book. Um, it is imperative to teach the Holocaust. It is crucial to engage in genocide education. We have to learn the lessons of history. Which brings us to today in the Ukraine. Like tonight when we, when we honor Yom HaShoah and the systemic and transnational annihilation of the Jewish people, that is not the same as what's happening in Ukraine. But I gotta tell you, the destruction and the obliteration of Ukraine by Putin with the claim of denazification and the 
the, the senseless killing of civilians and the shelling of population centers and so on and so forth, it is horrific. And I think we need to engage in genocide education more than anyone, our elected officials, so to actually learn those lessons and enact them. But we've also seen more practically, Frank, you know, uh, we do a lot of genocide education at ADL. Our program on Holo the Holocaust, we developed with Yad Vashem and the Shoah Foundation at USC. It's called Echoes and Reflections. We've done, um, we've done some empirical research and you find that pre and post, kids who learn about the Holocaust have diminished attitudes of prejudice, diminished expressions of prejudice. I mean, basically it works. So we need to do it because it helps our kids understand the price of prejudice and we need to do it because our policymakers seem so incapable of applying a little bit of memory even to great crises. And we need it so we look ahead. I mentioned, look, the, the annihilationist threat from, the, from Iran is not a joke. It's not an exaggeration. There was a report today, or, or there was a report this week in the Washington Post. You know, the administration claims that the Iranians are just a few weeks away from a nuclear device. Look, Iran says not just a threat to, just a threat to the Jewish people, it's a threat to America. And when they claim they want to destroy the great Satan, we should be listening to them, not ignoring them. We do that at our own peril. That's one of the lessons of Ukraine. That's one of the lessons of the Holocaust. Thank you. We're just about out of time. Uh, why don't I give you a moment uh, to say a few final words, and I'll mention uh, to all of you gathered here, as well as those who are watching, we have 400 copies of your book uh, that uh, we have with book plates that you've so graciously signed. If you're here in person, you can pick one up. If you didn't on your way in, please, on your way out, if you would pick up a copy of Jonathan Greenblatt's recently published book, It Could Happen Here. And for those of you who are watching, if you'd like a copy, we will make one. Uh, uh, we will have them for you uh, through my office. Uh, you can just stop by uh, and pick one up with one of the book plates. So, Jonathan, would you like to say a, a few final words uh, to the audience? Well, I, th I think what I would simply say in closing is that, um, number one, I want to thank again the Zorovsky family for endowing this lecture and giving me the opportunity to be here. It's a privilege. I want to thank Dr. Franklin and, and you, Dr. Wu, for being with me tonight. I want to thank all of you for coming out. And again, on this era of Yom HaShoah, I think the way we can do a service to the six million who were slaughtered and honor their martyrdom, the way we can do a service to those who are, again, suffering so much today in Ukraine, is by literally imbibing these lessons to make this a more perfect union. Not to take for granted what we have, but to knuckle down and to lean in and to fight for it. So fight for it doesn't mean you go pick up a gun. I'm not saying that. But democracy is not a spectator sport. I'll repeat, democracy is not a spectator sport that you can watch you know, from the seats. Just assume you know how it ends. You know, the Nets got swept last night, right? <laughs> it was Monday night. It was Monday night. They got swept. But you know what? They'll be back next season. Like, there is no next season in the game of life. Don't think that there's some for, it's, it's preordained that you know how this ends. So leaning in means getting involved. Leaning in means volunteering. Leaning in means showing up to vote. Leaning in means serving in your community. Leaning in means running for the library board. Being a, a poll watcher. Again, it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat or an Independent. Getting past these, these silly tribal differences and really focusing on the things that we have in common. So ultimately, democracy, not a spectator sport, you gotta grab a ball and get on the field. You're never too old and you're never too young. So. Thank you so very much. Please join me in thanking Jonathan Greenblatt. And again, copies of his book with a book plate are available just outside. Uh, they're free to everyone in the audience. Thank you so much for joining us.